Welcome to Mental Health Mini number 12, Legal Parameters in the Care of Psychiatric Patients. To start off, when we talk about the legal parameters of psychiatric nursing care, we talk about the admission process and how people are admitted to an inpatient facility. One way that they can be admitted is through voluntary, and this means that the patient is choosing to be admitted to an inpatient facility on their own. They do have to fill out some paperwork and be medically cleared, but they have to um, indicate that they believe they're a threat of safety to themselves. The second method is through involuntary admission, and this is when it's against the patient's will or when the patient does not believe that they need psychiatric treatment in an inpatient facility. Because it is against their will, it takes more than one person to get someone involuntarily admitted. The first person is someone to fill out a petition form. This petition form can be filled out by a family member, friends, um, a provider, social worker, really anyone that believes that that patient may need psychiatric treatment in an inpatient facility. The petition form has to show that they're either a danger to themselves, a danger to others, or that the severity of their mental illness is so strong that it's going to impact their ability to effectively comply with treatment and effectively care for themselves and prevent any decline in their symptoms. Once they've been petitioned, they're brought to the hospital where they're medically cleared and where they see a um, psychiatrist. The psychiatrist will evaluate them and determine if they are true to the petition. So they're going to look at the petition and say, oh, this person is a threat to themselves. After evaluating with them, I agree with it. And then they fill out what's called a clinical certificate. After the first clinical certificate is filled out, the patient is brought up to the inpatient unit where within 24 hours, they have to be seen by a second psychiatrist who does have to be a different psychiatrist who also evaluates them. If they agree with the petition in the first clinical certificate, then they'll fill out a second clinical certificate. That second clinical certificate is what makes the patient fully admitted through involuntary status. There are different laws throughout the United States based on the state of how long we can hold someone in a facility involuntarily. Because of this, a patient may be set up with a probate court, which we're going to talk about in a slide or two. And that probate court will determine if they need a court order for treatment and if we can hold that patient in an inpatient facility against their will for a longer amount of time. The third way that you can be admitted to an inpatient facility is based on an existing order. In an existing order, the patient has already been put on a court order for treatment. With that court order for treatment, they legally have to apply and comply with their care. If they don't, so let's say they're discharged from a facility, they're um, you know, living at home and they don't take their medications or they don't go to their follow-up appointments, then they're brought back into the hospital to the inpatient setting with an existing order. If they're on the existing order, we do not have to go through that petition and certificate process that we do with involuntary admissions. So now some legal issues within the hospital stay. So as I've mentioned a couple of times, the court order for treatment. Court order for treatment starts off with a mental health probate court hearing. This is non-punitive and it determines if the patient needs an order for treatment based on their ability to comply with care and to um, understand their treatment options. This is usually set for about two weeks out of their date of admission. If the patient's still there, they have the option to attend that court hearing, or they can defer saying, I don't think I need a court order for treatment. And so that court order or that um, probate court would be delayed. They can only defer once. Um, or if they're discharged before the court date comes up, then they obviously would not have to go. There are different levels of court order for treatment and it designates how long you can keep that patient in a facility, as well as how long that patient needs to comply with care once discharged. So example, a 3060, the patient can be held for 30 days and they have to comply with treatment 60 days after discharge. 6090, they have to, they can be held in the inpatient facility for 60 days. They have to comply with treatment 90 days after discharge. 
91 years, same concept. This does not mean that we have to keep them in the hospital for 90 days. It just means that that's the amount of time that we can legally keep them in the hospital before we have to get a new court order for treatment or have that order extended. The expectations if someone is placed on a court order for treatment is that they cannot refuse medications or treatment and they must follow up with all care. The other legal thing that we can talk about is a three-day letter. These are only for voluntary patients. I know the slide says involuntary, but it's for voluntary patients who no longer feel the need for treatment. What they do is they talk to their psychiatrist and say, I don't feel that I need treatment anymore. I feel better or the issues that I was having when I came in are no longer there. And so the psychiatrist has three business days to evaluate that patient. If it is determined that the patient is doing better and that they're safe to leave, the patient must be discharged. If it's determined that discharge would pose a threat to that patient or others, the patient will be petitioned, inserted, and readmitted under an involuntary status. Another aspect of legality in mental health care is the concept of competency. And this is something that we evaluate to determine if the patient is either fit to stand trial or if they're fit to make their own health care decisions. The criteria is that they have to have awareness of the situation. They have to have understanding of the consequences of actions. And they have to be able to communicate their wishes and understanding with others. If it's a situation of fit to stand trial, they have to be able to communicate that with their lawyers. So what fit to stand trial means is if someone with a mental illness has committed a crime, it's determining if they're able to participate in the court process. We call this forensics. Um, if someone's determined not fit to stay in trial because they are incompetent, they would be sent to a forensic center where they're treated to try and gain competency and they're reevaluated every six months until they're determined fit to stay in trial. If they're never determined fit to stay in trial, they can be ruled as being not guilty by reason of insanity. This helps to, deter, helps to determine if their sentence will be served in prison or a forensic center. So if it's deemed that the patient is not guilty by reason of insanity, they will get the same sentence that they would if they were guilty, but they'll fill that sentence at a forensic center instead of a prison. If they're able to be fit to stand trial and they're determined to have competency, then they would serve it in prison instead of a forensic center. And then we have duty to warn. So duty to warn is a legal obligation to breach confidentiality when a patient poses a threat to others. When a patient does pose a threat to others, we can only break that confidentiality to communicate that with those who need to know. And this would be the authorities and the individual at risk. Another legal concept in mental health nursing is the concept of a guardianship. A guardian is a person responsible for the healthcare decisions of a patient diagnosed with a mental illness. They do sign off consent on all treatment, and occasionally they may also be considered the patient's payee, which means that they are in control of that patient's finances. A guardian does have to be court appointed, and it can either be a family member or it can be a lawyer. The patient must be determined incompetent in order to have a guardian. And then lastly, we have psychiatric advanced directives. And these are similar to your um, wills or advanced directives, but it outlines patient care preferences in lieu of a psychiatric emergency. So the individual creates their, advanced, their psychiatric advanced directive when they're considered competent or when they're not going through a mental health crisis. So they can say, yes, if I become psychotic, these are the medications I prefer, or when I become psychotic, these are things that help me calm down. Or if I become very aggressive, these are what commonly triggers me. They outline things that they find helpful and what their preferences are so that if a psychiatric emergency does occur, they can implement those specific practices when possible. They are not necessarily utilized everywhere, but they are growing in popularity. And there's no... Um, legal rules that say that we have to follow a psychiatric advance directive. It's just a form of guidance for us to help make better decisions that fit with what that patient desires and needs.
and that is the psychiatric mini on legality and psychiatric nursing.